Hello, peace. I plan on responding to a video I recently saw and his arguments. I'm rather flabbergasted that this man has a, as a pastor, uh, and he didn't have the historical context uh, for Second Temple period that he should have had um, been taught in school. Now, I've never gone to a seminar school and I've never investigated what they teach at a Presbyterian seminar, but it seems rather curious that they would have neglected to mention all of the details that I will explain below. I'm making this video as a reply video because I'm worried that a lot of people will watch his um, video and just simply accept what he said without doing the proper research for themselves. In Mark 7, 14, that amongst the things they ceremonially wash, and again, remember the Greek word underlined the word wash there, are the following items. Uh, their vessels, their cups, their pots, and their tables. Now, that all of those, <laughs> well, several of those would be difficult to submerge in water, okay? Um, not so much the cups or the pots or the vessels, but when you get to the tables, and as some translations have it, uh, couches, I think there's either a variant there or a different translation calls it a couch, but either way, your tables, do, they, do the Pharisees really baptize their tables all the way? Do they submerge them? Um, do they call the dinner bell? They say, hey, everybody, uh, it's dinner time. But first, don't forget to wash your hands and the pots and the cups. And by the way, let's get that table and let's march it all the way down to the river, all the way down in, all the way back up. Is that what's implied there? Obviously not. The ceremonial washing would be a sprinkling or perhaps even a pouring. And so here he starts off with Mark 7, 14, discussing the various washings that the Pharisees would do. He makes the assumption that they wash the table and completely submerged it in water before every meal. While a pious Jew at the time did go to extreme lengths to obey the oral commandments, such as standing in one spot until sunset if they walk too far on the Sabbath, that was called a Sabbath day journey, uh, we will see in a moment that this is not the explanation. Uh, in John Lightfoot's commentary on Mark chapter 7, he actually suggests the washing of these utensils and tables are done after they are purchased in the market. A Jewish community would have a mikvah, it's a bath, for these uh, circumstances. I believe you may find more details in Mishnah Yadayim and Mishnah Mikavot and other places of the Mishnah and Talmud dealing with this topic. Another thing about this that I will mention quickly, which will be the basis for most of these arguments, is that every community had a mikvah, and most homes had a mikvah as well. If you don't know what a mikvah is, it's a large ritualistic bathing tub or pool. And we're told that they would take two birds, and one of the birds would be killed, and the other bird would be alive. And what we were supposed to do, according to this, is to take the living bird and the wood and the hyssop and scarlet and bapto or baptizo them into the blood of the slain bird. Now, I don't know if you've <laughs> killed a bird lately, hopefully not, but there's not a lot of blood in there. Okay, so you're going to get an entire bird, live bird, submerged into the blood of the other bird. Uh, no, that's not possible. Now, somebody says, but wait a second, Pastor Matt. Here uh, it is mentioned, and the living water, which kind of gave the answer away. It was slain, the bird, over living water. And so the blood was mixed with the water. Uh, and that would provide enough substance to dip it in. Even the Targum, Jonathan, and the Jewish translations say it very clearly. It is in both water and the blood. Another one. Um, this one's from the New Testament. Back to New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 3 says this, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, he says, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all things the same and did all eat the same spiritual meat again first corinthians chapter 10. well here we have a waterless baptism in fact this is a completely dry baptism there's water in the scene as the red sea has been split asunder 
but it's not the Israelites that get wet at all, um, but it's the army of the Egyptians and Pharaoh who are actually the ones who are deluged and submerged in water. And yet we're told here though that it was the Israelites who were baptized into Moses. Well, it'd be pretty difficult to immerse them into Moses, whatever that might even mean. Here he makes a straw man suggesting that the baptizo is only when dealing with water, according to the Baptist theology. I'm not a Baptist, by the way. Water, though, isn't the main idea of baptism in every place. It is also the idea of immersion. That's what the word actually means. He is confused because of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 2, where it says they are baptized into Moses. They are immersed in the immersion of Moses, a.k.a. the Torah. You can see that in Acts 15, 21, you can also be baptized into the figurative fire. That's in Matthew 3, 11. And enduring, you can endure punishment as a baptism, which is Mark 10, 38. All the same idea is being conveyed that baptism is immersion into something. Yeshua wasn't sprinkled with punishment for our sins. He was immersed. Daniel chapter 4, verse 33. This is an interesting one regarding King Nebuchadnezzar. It says in the King James, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat the grass as oxen, and his body was wet, bapto, with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Now, that would be a very dewy morning indeed for Nebuchadnezzar's entire body to be submerged or immersed of the dew of the grass. Now, this is where things get tricky. He keeps going to verses that say bapto in the Greek, both in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The issue with this is bapto uh, is different than baptisma. That's Strong's G 911. Bapto, this word is given a definition as such and paints a different picture than Strong's G 908, which is a baptisma. Uh, to to whelm, i.e. to cover wholly with fluid in the New Testament, only in a qualified or special sense, to literally to moisten uh, a part of one's person, or to, by implication to stain as with dye, dip, is uh, altogether obvious. Here's another one for Samuel 14, uh, 27. This relates to Jonathan. Remember the vow related to anybody eating before... Um, before the, the victory is won, it says this, But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath, wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it, bapto, baptizo, in an honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. Now, obviously there, what happens is he takes his staff or his rod and he dips it, he touches it, he, he, he moistens it with the honeycomb, but there's no way you could take an entire staff and submerge it or immerse it into a honeycomb. There's just not that much honey available. Same rule applies as above, but to further support this, I found on the Blue Letter Bible this statement, quote, not to be confused with 907, baptos, baptizo. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 BC. It is a recipe for making pickles and is helpful because it uses both words. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should first be dipped, bapto, into boiling water and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern, concern the immersion of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary, the second the act of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change. There is a difference between 907, 908, and 911. Do this for a homework assignment. Go through the New and Old Testament teachings related to the Holy Spirit, and, and you will not find much language related to one being immersed down into the Holy Spirit, but you will find a great amount of material related to the Holy Spirit being poured out upon his people which is one of the reasons why I personally prefer baptism by pouring, because I think that best shows the picture of the Holy Ghost uh, anointing or the Holy Ghost unction that only Jesus Christ can give us, that baptism of the Holy Spirit.
Here, he tries to say that we are not literally submerged in the Holy Spirit. At least that's kind of the idea that I got. Uh, the Spirit is said to both dwell on and within Daniel 5.14, Acts 1.8, Luke 1.35, and is com uh, compared to filling up, oops, and is compared to filling up of water, John 7.38. I.e. you are both filled up with and covered with. That's a Psalms 91.4 reference. Sketches this out so that Hebrews 9.13 is actually pointing back to Numbers 19.17. Hebrews 9, 19 is pointing back to Exodus 24, 6, and 8. And Hebrews 9, 21 is pointing back to Leviticus 8, 19 and 16, 14. Now you can look all those up on your own time if you want. But in every single case, those various baptisms that he's discussing here are Old Testament priestly ordinances in which there is the sprinkling of blood. And so these various baptisms are actually in all cases... So is the word for sprinkling in, the he in Hebrews 9 passage, the idea that his blood cleanses us all so much so that we only need a drop. Baptism is, a, is different, yet that it identifies us with his death and resurrection. Uh, these are two completely different ideas. Here are the proof texts, Mark 1.10, and the argument goes, well, the text goes, straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descending upon him. And Baptists will very often seize upon the language of, he came up out of the water. So what, will, what does that mean? Well, the Baptist will tell you that he was down in the water. He was submerged. He was immersed. And so um, they will describe to you John the Baptist and Jesus going down into the water next to each other. And John taking Jesus and laying him down into the water all the way in and bringing him back up. And that, and then they come up out of the water back onto dry land. And they'll tell you that that's how it happened because of the phrase, they came up out of the water. The only problem there is we actually don't know what they did in the water. We don't know what the mechanism of, of baptism because... Nobody told us. John did not invent that baptism, as this was also being done majorly by the ASEAN community with their dogma attached to daily life away from the Jerusalem system. They opposed, and they thought that everything made them ritually unclean. So they had tons of mikvahs. I will provide a link below that will explain further the pre-existing nature of the baptism model in the uh, Jerusalem community. Furthermore, in the Jewish wedding model, the bride and the groom are baptized in water. Uh, John was the best man of Yeshua, and this is why he, Yeshua, is also baptized to connect the models. Um, if you actually watch how people are baptized, even by immersion, you'll notice that there's all kinds of different ways that that happens. Uh, some people will be baptized forward. Some people will be baptized back. Some people will be baptized straight down. Some people will be baptized once, twice, and thrice in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how it's performed today. But we actually don't know. Um, so now he's trying to say that we just don't know how it was done. Not only does he try to impose a sense of legalism on the people who want to be baptized, like Yeshua, but we also have a plethora of examples, like the fact that the Talmud, the Old Testament, the customs at the time, the Essene community, uh, the language in the descriptive passages in the New Testament, and the Didache all point towards actual water submersion, with the exception in a rare uh, circumstance mentioned in the Didache. If you don't know what that is, check it out. It's awesome. Also, the Jordan River is very deep river, not to mention that there's descriptive passages of it overflowing in the Bible, which is Joshua 3.15. Artwork related to baptism. Uh, there are some very ancient paintings and some of the catacombs and whatnot of, of baptism taking place in the first couple of centuries uh, in the New Testament era. And you might be just surprised at what they typically paint when they're painting a baptism scene. Normally, what, what is painted is uh, two figures standing there, standing in waist-deep water, 
and one pouring water with a shell or a vessel onto the other's head. And so that could have been what happened in the New Testament age. Here he tries to suggest the artistic representations at the time is accurate for how people would have been baptized. While this may be true, there are a ton of issues with this idea, ranging from the fact that the Catholic Church fell away from the original traditions of the Judeo-Christianity. Um, they have their heavy emphasis on symbolism, and the traditions that they adhere to uh, strongly, which is different than what they would have done originally. Art is symbolic and thematic, but not always literal. If you read the early church fathers, you will see that they shifted their perspective on what was a traditional way of doing things and all aspects of faith. So they moved away from that. A later example doesn't mean it's the earlier example. Interestingly, we have far more about how to perform a the Lord's Supper, such as 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul gives us rather extended commentary on exactly how he wants the Lord's Supper to take place and even what he wants to, to be said at that meeting. Just a little side note about this one. Paul is talking about keeping Passover, not some man-made ritualistic doctrine of a weekly or monthly Eucharist. But it's difficult then to explain how the shell became an early symbol of Christianity other than in its usefulness for the scooping of water and the pouring out of water onto a person. For this. In the description below, I will supply a link which will detail the reason for the shell. Two, about making the baptism of Jesus normative. And what I mean by that is, okay, so you want to follow the baptism of Jesus. I get it. How precisely do you want to follow it? So if you're saying we should immerse because Jesus was immersed, do you also do your baptisms outside? Okay, because Jesus was baptized outside. And you, you just said, my Baptist friend, you just said that you want to be baptized like Jesus. So you get baptized outside, right? You don't do them indoors. They wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have had pools in their synagogues or in their homes or in their churches. Um, you baptize outside because you're like Jesus? Um, and if you do baptize outside, you do baptize in a river, right? Because that's how Jesus was baptized. So how far are we going to carry this? You see where I'm going with this? Once again, it seems uh, like he's projecting a spirit of legalism onto something that just doesn't need to be complicated. Okay, so clear, clearly here, if we're going to take this text literally, Paul becomes Saul does not leave the house of Ananias. He recounts his experience of Christ. Uh, Ananias preaches the gospel to him. Uh, he has a fuller understanding of these things. Ananias encourages him, and he gets baptized right there in the house, probably by pouring or by sprinkling, almost certainly not by immersion. So as we deal with Paul's baptism and what he just mentioned not too long ago, we can actually look at this artistic rendition uh, titled Baptism of St. Paul by Ananias. Capella Palantia. Uh, beyond that, this has already been mentioned, but many houses had a ritualistic mikvah in them, and if they were poor, there was one in most or all communities. Uh, it's really not too far-fetched that they may even had a bath available, because, I mean, you're supposed to bath. Never left the house. Saul become Paul is bad. Here he tries to say Saul became Saul. Uh, he had two names, one for the Romans and one as his Hebrew name, Shual, Shual, Shual. I don't know how to pronounce it. This was commonplace even at Saul's conversion. You don't see Yeshua calling Saul Paul. This happens much later in Acts chapter 12, I think. 3,000 souls that were baptized on Pentecost Day itself, Acts 2, 41. It says they gladly received his word and were baptized talking about Peter's preaching here. And the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. So Peter's sermon is used by God in such a tremendous and, and gracious way. 3,000 people get saved and they're baptized. Now, I have just a fun little challenge for you. I want you to tell me which body of water uh, in the city of Jerusalem near the temple is sufficient to immerse or submerge 3,000 people. So he's amazed in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 people could have been baptized at, well, around the same time. The issue with this is that there were mikvahs all over the temple grounds 
Not only that, but this was Pentecost at a pilgrimage feast. I'm sure there would have been lots of preparation at the time for people to cleanse themselves before the temple services. After all, this was in the upper room in the house, aka the temple grounds, where they gathered together every Pentecost. Uh, furthermore, all things are possible through God. So if you wanted then to submerge, you would have a way for them to be submerged. If God wanted that to happen, he could have had that happen. Okay, so what from this text is the meaning of circumcision? The meaning of circumcision is the righteousness that is had by faith. Okay, that's what I just said, Romans 4.11. Look it up in the KJV or any other translation you want to. The point of circumcision is that it is a sign and a seal of the righteousness that is had by faith. But why then, I ask you, if it is a sign of faith, is it applied to infants? Well, it applied to infants. Well, for the very same reason that baptism is applied to infants as well. Okay. Here he mentions circumcision, which is actually about a covenantal relationship. Uh, Genesis 17, 13, and obedience to the commandments. Uh, there is also a commandment to circumcise the child on the eighth day, but there is no New Testament commandment for a child to be submerged in water. Why? Uh, the command is an individual's response. Some of my final thoughts on this. Uh, firstly, I think he's making the exception the rule. Um, yes, if you're stranded out there in the wilderness and you have no water, but someone comes to Christ and they say, I want to get baptized. Well, sure, let's pour some water on them. Okay. But when you have easily act, when you have access to water, um, you know, and every example in the New Testament and the Old Testament is submersion, you're kind of drawing a really far conclusion here. And I honestly think he's trying to force uh, the traditions of men. It's uh, very strange how he neglected to mention a lot of very obvious historical and linguistic uh, truths related to the things that he spoke about. Is he trying to mislead the lay folks? I don't know. Imagine on that day that someone approaches the Lord and he's turned away. It was on his heart to be submerged in water, to identify himself with Yeshua's death and resurrection, and to keep the commandment that he gave before he left. But when he went to you, you said, let's just sprinkle some on your forehead. And then he's turned away because he hardened his heart. He will say to Yeshua, but my pastor told me this is the way. And Yeshua will say, what your pastor said was wrong. Do I think that everyone who's not baptized won't be saved? Once again, we don't have to make the exception the rule. But there is a commandment and one that can be fulfilled and followed super easily. Anyways, thank you for your time. And hope you all have a great day.